Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. As I said at the start of today's show, one in three Nigerian women and one in eight Nigerian men are victims of sexual violence today. It is extremely important for us to hold these conversations and continue to fuel the conversation because we have to eradicate the rape culture in Nigeria. Now, who better to do that than a very good representative from the Stand to End Rape Initiative? Aisha Salaudin is in the studio with us, and she's going to be speaking to us about the importance of incorporating sexual education into our school curriculums today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you. Very now, I think we should start off with Stand to End Rape as an organization. What exactly is Stand to End Rape? How did you guys start? What is your mission and your vision? Okay, so Stand to End Rape is a not-for-profit organization and it's youth-led. So the aim of Stand to End Rape basically is to address um, sexual and reproductive health and rights in the country. So it's very wide-ranging from um, all different forms of sexual abuse to um, sex education. So our, our basic aim is to sort of create a space for um, survivors of sexual abuse, to create a space where they're okay with sharing their stories and to also educate people um, about sexual abuse in general because there's um, a knowledge deficit um, in that area. So the aim is just all things sexual abuse, more people need to know about it and of course to offer help to survivors of sexual abuse like we have psychosocial help, um, legal help as well. So all things ranging um, and okay. we started in two, 2014. It was just um, an idea that our executive director came up with, it was like from her own personal experience and so she gathered just a group of like-minded people and decided that we needed to you know, fix the problem. And that's okay. That's it, basically. Okay. Yeah. You like, mentioned about creating a safe space yeah. for people who have been survivors of mm -hmm. violence. We find that Nigeria is not quite the safe space. More importantly, social media. So, what have you done, or what are you doing, to help correct this anomaly? Um, yes, truly, Nigeria is not like the perfect example for creating a safe space. So, we're doing a bunch of things. Let me just. I'll just give some examples. First of all, the knowledge isn't even there at all. So when people hear sexual abuse, some people don't even know what it encompasses, what it's about. So we sort of do these things where we create awareness around it, especially around, um, we start with small kids because, you know, as they grow up, they need this information. So we talk to people in schools, we're educating them that this is what sexual abuse is, this is what rape culture is, you don't, um, you're not supposed to touch on that person inappropriately and so on and so forth. Just trying to break, you know, the culture of silence and the de knowledge barrier that is there. So we've had a couple of, for example, this year, I'll just use some examples. Um, this year, we've been to a couple of schools in Lagos State and we're talking to kids about um, sexual abuse. We're talking to them about HIV AIDS. We're um, speaking to the Ministry of Education about infusing sex education into the curriculum. Those, those um, few things. And we, of course, also offer um, legal services. So we do not represent people in court, for example, but we have like paralegals and um, um, lawyers who like follow up with like court cases because we do have people who come to us and say you know what um somebody has been sexually abused can you just make sure that this doesn't you know um slip out of court can you make sure that you follow this and then so we do those type of things um we also um provide the therapy so if a victim if we spot a victim of any form of sexual abuse we have like in-house psychiatrists in-house um psychosocial and um psychosocial analysts who sort of just look at these people talk to them if they have to get to a psychiatrist for a diagnosis we do that as well just um just a bunch of stuff around ensuring that people get the amount of help that they need pretty much okay this is extremely interesting and we are going to get into the education system in a bit but let's focus on this knowledge deficit just for a minute yeah. how how bad is the knowledge deficit in nigeria really and truly <clears throat> um so i'll have to say that it's actually getting better we're not there yet but you notice now more especially with the help of social media more people seem to be uh conscious about it more people are speaking about it so yes we haven't gotten to where we need to be but it's not as bad as it used to be at least people are before now people didn't even have the you know people didn't used to talk about it publicly it wasn't like an, a good thing to say outside but now we have more people sort of addressing rape addressing sexual abuse addressing family planning things that normally when you if you thought like 10 years ago about it nobody would ever like come out to publicly speak about it so it is getting better we just have to put in more effort okay yeah. now let's talk about some of the things you mentioned earlier that one of the things you do would be yeah. to create awareness as to what constitutes sexual abuse yes. so can you please educate us some more on what constitutes sexual abuse because we find out a lot of people think it's only sexual abuse when you rape someone yeah okay so interestingly nigeria has a very, um, has a rape culture so what that means is that um nigeria's environment creates a Nigeria's environment basically excuses all forms of um, violence. So it could be something as simple as trivializing um, a rape victim's 
you know, story, things like questioning her, like, why were you outside at night? Why, why are you complaining that he touched you when you visited him? So these are the little things that constitute um, sexual harassment and sexual abuse. But people don't think, people think that it is when it gets to rape. You know, questioning, questioning the victim, questioning her motives, uh, telling boys that, oh, well, boys will be boys, but um, painting them as superior beings, these type of little things. Even when you start policing a woman, when you start telling her, advising her on how not to get raped, what you're doing is, um, what you're doing is harassment, abuse, because even though you might have good intentions, you're already excusing the rapist because you're only telling her how to avoid being raped. You're not telling the rapist, well, don't rape. So these little things are also part of the problem. It's not until you get to where you have raped someone. Even making sex jokes, you know, comedians that when they come out and make these jokes, it is also a problem. It is harassment and it can, you know, lead to abuse. Mm -hmm. So these are the little, little things that we have to address before we even get to the point of rape. It's not just rape. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Now let's bring all of this into education, our okay. topic for today. A couple weeks ago on social media, a lot of young women came out expressing that certain men had sexually harassed them or raped them. Yeah. Now what was shocking to me was that a lot of the men that were named were as young as 15 years old yes. and therefore we know that we have a serious problem on our yes. hands. Why is it extremely important to incorporate sexual education into our school curriculums and why is this something that STIR are pushing on? Okay, so the most, um, I would say for one, people don't really understand what it's about. And so when you start from boys as young as 15, in fact, as young as 12, you know, you start let, giving them the basic knowledge they need to know these things. Truly, truly, some of these um, young boys and girls don't know what it means to be abused, don't understand all these things. So there's a knowledge deficit, like I, I said. So you'd have to start from the young age, start telling them about their body, start telling them about dating, about rape, abuse. When you start, you know, um, narrowing that knowledge gap, it helps. It helps them. To, it helps, you know, us to raise better boys and girls. So things like what you said on social media, you'd notice that even um, I was tracking the replies, and you notice that some of those people accused did not even realize that what they were doing was, you know, sexual harassment or sexual abuse. Some of them said, "Well, I mean, I just touched her." You know, and then people, you have people asking, "Well, did she say that you could touch her?" And then they start saying, "No, hold on." I don't know if she did or not. So there's generally a knowledge gap and knowledge deficit. And that's why STEER believes that you have to start from, you know, secondary, primary school students. You have to start telling them from when they are little so they, they understand these things. Because if you notice, the Nigerian environment sort of excuses this type of things. You'd have parents even saying things like, um, don't go to that boy because he's going to touch you inappropriately. Why don't you tell the boy not to touch, you know, the girl as but well? But you know what, and parents so is actually, sorry, parents yeah. is where I'm leading to with this because I feel like the greatest problem that we may be mm -hmm. seeing here with incorporating sexual education into schools is that a lot of parents are also uncomfortable with exactly. the fact that their children are going to be learning sex education. Yes. So we have a stigma problem there as well. Exactly. So um, interestingly, when um, STEP presented, because we made these CSE documents, that's Comprehensive Sex Education Documents, and presented it to the Ministry of Education. Interestingly, it was obviously parents that were saying things like, well, we're not sure about certain words. So they were very excited about the documents, but you'd, you'd notice that they say things like, can you not use the word condoms, please? Can you not talk to them about sex? So parents, you'd know that there's a stigma. They're very worried about the words, and the excuse is just, you know, we don't want these kids to go out thinking this is okay. But in reality, if you do not address it, then it becomes a problem. So if we're talking about sex education and we don't tell them about condoms, how are they going to know what it's for? How are they going to know that they can actually prevent, you know, getting STDs, you know, using condoms? How will they know these things? So there's a general culture of silence around these things. Parents think that they are protecting the children by not telling them about this. And this is also where the knowledge problem comes in again. We would have, you know, sometimes we find ourselves talking to parents saying, and teachers as well saying, you know what, this is why you have to tell them because you're doing a greater disservice if you don't. So at the moment, it's not looking very good in, on, on the part of the you know, federal government because they're very worried that it's going to make the children worse off and expose them to these sorts of things. But in truth, it's something that we have to address because if you don't understand that, you know, using um, all these things is going to prevent you from getting an STD, then you just go out and do whatever you want to do without knowing. But imagine if they had, you know, the knowledge, if, we ha if the parents and teachers allow us to teach them, then they know better next time and think, hang on, I don't want to do this because I do not want to get an STD. I don't want to do this because I don't want to get, you know, um, an unwanted pregnancy, these type of things. So, yes, I completely agree that parents have a role to play, and that is why we have to keep addressing it, talking to parents about it. When you present the advantages over the disadvantages, then they start to, you know, slowly get 
convinced. Beyond them being taught in the school, yes. parents also need to warm up to the idea of sex education at, at home. home. Yeah, so exactly. at what age do you think is appropriate to start sex education for a child? So we believe that as soon as the child is able to understand and communicate properly. It's just that the level of, you know, whatever you're teaching them is different. So I know um, what we encourage at there, for example, is once the child can understand and speak, you know, you start telling the child about different parts of your body, uh, of their bodies. So this is this part of your body and this is what it does. Do we have Nobody to call the taught, exact you names? You have to call the exact names because, you know, sometimes when people use nicknames and um, all these weird names, the child, it, 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 the child doesn't really... Um, understand. understand but when you say so this is this is this part of your body this is your private part nobody is nobody is allowed to touch you there then the child knows imme immediately someone touches you know the child there he remembers that oh well my mom said something like this and now it's interesting because I've seen a bunch of like studies for children where there's like songs they're singing about it like nobody's allowed to touch me so I think as soon as the child is little and can understand sorry as soon as the child can understand Start telling the child. I'm thinking also the definition of private parts should also should be specific, extend. actually. So beyond so. talking about the parts that we know as private parts, yes. I think also we should be talking about parts like your face, your lips, yes. because some people abuse the child without not touching their body, but they could use lips as well. So yes. I've heard the parents say, nobody should touch your lips, yes. nobody should touch your face, nobody should touch your breasts, nobody should touch these other parts of your body yes. if they do scream and come and, and come come to me. Yes. So we actually, truly, you're absolutely correct, and that's why I'm emphasizing on the need to mention all these things, the names. Mm -hmm. So if anyone touches you inappropriately in your face, if anyone, if you feel uncomfortable, the moment you feel that this is wrong, this is weird, scream and come and talk to your parents. And you find out that when you build a relationship with them from when they're very little, they're super comfortable growing up, moving forward to talk to you about these things. And so beyond like, you know, knowing what's right and what's wrong, you also build a relationship with your child. So you when know, you have that, that birds and bees talk when they're like 14, 15, 16, yeah, it's, it's not awkward. Very awkward. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Indeed. But what I find very interesting here is that I feel as though sexual education as a whole is extremely stigmatized for many reasons. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the most prominent reason is based on culture. Yes. People have an issue with naming parts of the body, and that is just the starting point. This is an entire scope mm -hmm. of problems that all fall into it, fueling the rape culture. Mm -hmm. Aside from education in school and education at home, how else can we start working against this culture? Um, I would say that you should start, we should get people that have, um, I wouldn't say that have experienced sexual abuse, but people who know um, a lot about this to come out and share their stories. So what I would say is, I'll give an example. So. Um, Someone who, who's been harassed or whatever, you know, there are tons of people that have been harassed. So if someone who's been harassed comes out to say, you know, well, hang on, this happened to me mm. and this is okay. And, you know, this is what I did. This is how I, you know, you know, overcame whatever it is. And then you sort of find that people are, people are now thinking, well, my case is not peculiar. It's happened to this person. And then she's, you know, talking about it. She's speaking. So that means I can, I can overcome it, you know, I can. So if you have more people coming together, like what you said about social media, where, it started with one person, you know, one, one woman came out and said, I'm not going to, you know, keep quiet, this is what happened. And then, you know, the result was magnificent. Before, you know, people started sharing their stories. And then it led to, you know, um, Stan to Endrip during that moment got a lot of names and got a lot of people saying, can I get a lawyer? How, what should I do next? We had so many reports. So with people like that coming out to share their stories and encouraging others, you realize like you're stronger when there are more people as opposed to just one person. So, so we need to start a conversation exactly. or we need to keep more the conversation, conversation going so that we can probably have our own Me Too movement. We're starting to see exactly. the rise of that here in Nigeria. Yes, but we find also that many people who have been raped or who mm -hmm. have been sexually abused are not really willing to take the matter to court for several reasons. Reasons of stigma from family and mm -hmm. society, you know, fear of caught not dispensing justice and fear mm -hmm. of maybe the other party, the perpetrator, being more influential mm -hmm. and manipulating the matter. Mm -hmm. How can we get rid of this and get more people to come out, speak up, and to name, name and shame the perpetrators? Okay, so beyond um, more people talking about it and give, giving them encouragement, we would have, it has to be on the part of our legal system as well. So um, personally, I'd mention legal state because I'm familiar. Like We have DSVRT and stuff. They're doing a um, bunch of work on this. Like We've gotten... Um, names, people in court. So you can see the progress, like you can see that perpetrators are like, you know, they're in for it here. So those type of things actually will give more people um, leverage, like, hold on, this is actually happening and this is working. I don't, I'm not really familiar with other states, so I don't know what it's like there, but I know that generally on the larger scale, these, the legal system is not as great as it, it can be, you know, in, you know, 
handling um, rape issues. So when you have like security officials, like police officers and stuff, when you know they're there for you, you let you tend to feel um, better about it. Because if you notice, when you, people want to report, you know the first thing that rolls out of their mouth is why? Why should I even go? Because nobody's even going to listen to me. You know? But when there's a system in place and they're sure, or they've seen so many examples of people you know, going in and getting justice, then they'll feel better about it. And again, it still comes back to more people speaking about it, encouraging them, and that's what we try to do at there. So we, we can't force people to, you know, take their case to cause. We can only, you know, give them reasons why and sort of try to convince them. And so that's why, again, the legal system has to be there as well, to, so that when we say, you should go to court, this sentence is going to happen, and then they say, well, can you give me examples when there's been progress? Then we can say something like, actually there's actually mm. progress so look at this so again it's i mean we can try to do something but the legal system and operators have to back us as okay, well okay there's something that i'd like you to clear up i have often heard the notion that in nigeria's history mm -hmm. or post-independence history at least there have only been 14 prosecutions in the country for rape true or false so it's true okay so we're looking at a situation where 14 people 14 people in a country of 198 million have been prosecuted for rape. Only 14, and that is a very serious it's, issue. It's very which scary. leads me to ask you about your views on self-protection. And I say this because while I was in university, in my mm -hmm. first year of university, the first thing I was given on campus was a rape alarm. And, of course, that's not in Nigeria. Yeah. I've tried to incorporate this exact same initiative into Nigerian universities. But what exactly is your view on self-protection and how necessary is it? So, I mean, the sad reality is that it is very necessary. I mean, it should not have to be. We shouldn't have to, you know, be that... Uh, we shouldn't have to have to protect ourselves. People should, <coughs> should know not to rape. But the sad reality is that we have to. And that's why we actually encourage self-defence classes. So know, know that um, you can protect yourself from a potential rapist or abuser. We have those classes in Abuja and Lagos and very soon Port Harcourt. So I would completely say that if you can get a self-defence kit, that's that's fine. If you can fight off your rapist, it's good. Anything to protect yourself at this, you know, well, anything legal to protect yourself, you know, at this point is quite absolutely necessary. Um, yeah. All right, let's talk about real quick, first aid for rape. So someone has just been raped, mm -hmm. and of course the next thing she wants to do is just to quickly move on and get over mm -hmm. that. Well, you've worked with rape um, survivors, and you've helped them also to get legal personnel, mm -hmm. lawyers to help them put their matter in court. So mm -hmm. what are the things they need to do that would help them immediately on the spot, that would help their case have a stronger standing? Um, so we always advise that they go to the hospital. So if you notice that, if you go to the police station first, they'll say, well, there's no proof. Like, should, like how can we confirm that you get raped? So the hospital have um, some procedures. They would first, um, obviously, they would give you, like, um, the pills to protect you from SD, SDIs. They would give you, like, if you have to take a pregnancy test, all this type of things. And also, they can confirm that truly, um, this person has been raped so that if you have to make a police report when you get to you know make the police report the police can they can corroborate what you said like actually yes she's been here we've done this and this and then it sort of helps your case so we always say go to the hospital before you take to, a bath right because first thing to do go to the hospital you see but this is where mm -hmm. i have a slight problem because unfortunately as great as it sounds mm -hmm. and as practical as it sounds in reality it makes very little sense because mm -hmm. As a survivor of rape, mm -hmm. the first thing that you want to do in that situation, caring about yourself mm -hmm. only, is cleanse yourself from what you've just been through. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I think that what we need, and I need your opinion on this, is to see more policies that incorporate for survivors of rape that don't necessarily <clears throat> involve them having to follow every single practical step mm -hmm. in order for them to get justice. Because I don't believe that if someone was raped, God forbid, mm -hmm. Today, right now, as we're talking, and the first person that the first thing that that person wanted to do was to go and take a shower. Mm -hmm. Automatically, right now, based on our laws, that is basically going to take a lot the away risk, from their case. The risk so, do we there. need to see more policies coming into play that can actually help people who are in situations where they have minimal evidence on their case? I mean, definitely, we do, and that's why um, these rape kids is something that we have been. Um, shouting about fighting for and you know raising petitions because essentially what the rape kit does is it, it just does everything the hospital is going to do for you mm. so you don't actually have to you know go there because recounting your order is traumatizing enough as well so imagine having to say to the police and then the hospital so i would say that we need those policies we need things that will encourage women you know to more rape kits more um organizations like there to sort of look into things like that so you don't have to go through all these um, processes at the moment um it's looking good again in 
you know, we've had talks, I mean, I've seen uh, Senate President talking about incorporating not just the sexual abuse bill, but the gender bill, things like that. So it's looking like there's progress. And just today, I think, in Lagos State, there was a conversation again about um, women's rights and incorporating this in universities as well. So I think on the part of policies, it looks like there's going to be progress. Let's just hope that, you know, we get actual results at the moment. But definitely, we need those laws and policies. Until we get them for now, I think the risk attendant is because there are some fraudulent individuals mm -hmm. who might decide to take advantage of that. So legally, the law has to also make provision for the accused and the accuser as well with regards to the evidence. So please, for now, until the rape kit is being, you know, uh, we're having more of rape kits being used, Please, if you know anyone who's raped, first of all, please go get tested. Preferably, go to the hospital, a yeah. general hospital, preferably, yeah. to get to, to ensure that you're screened and then you have evidence. And we know it's difficult, you know, but you but need to speak you up. You have to be safe. You need to speak up. You need to be safe, but you need to speak up because in keeping silent, at the end of the day, you're encouraging the perpetrators to get away and they would hurt many more, more people, people and it will be on you for keeping quiet because, you know, there was nothing you could do about it. Final words, so we have people who are dealing with rape or abuse and they need someone to talk to or they need help. How can they contact you? Um, so we're on social media across all platforms, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Stand to End Rape. So our social media executives are literally always um, checking. So if you tweet at us, if you text us on Facebook, you know, we're there and we'll always respond. Is, is there a number people can call for emergencies? Um, I don't have the number right okay, now, but right. if you check social media. We can always get in touch. And you're doing a lot of work. You guys are actually doing a lot of work. And I know that your founder as well recently got called to the Obama Leaders Foundation. Yeah. So congratulations Thank to you guys. You Thank much. you so much. Continue to do everything that you're doing. Do not forget, if you do need to contact them, it's at Stand to End Rape across all social media platforms. They are one of Nigeria's leading um, organizations that stand against rape. So yeah, do go to them for any help that you may need, any more questions or advice. And, and do, Aisha, are you also open you. to volunteers, people who want to oh, be a part definitely, of Oh, definitely, definitely. We're always like looking for volunteers and we, anybody can join us and we will always find something for you depending on what you, what your background is. So anybody that wants to volunteer, again, just tweet at us, send us a message on Facebook and we'll, you know, Sorry, respond. just very quickly before we round up, with, in terms of the people who come to you for advice yeah. and help, what is the ratio between men and women? How many men also step forward with regards to cases that they've experienced? And so we have a lot more women than men, actually. Um, truly, you'd notice that men feel more... Again, the system just encourages men to be silent about yeah. it because they feel like you're just stronger and a better man if you don't. But we do have some men come up, but the women are way more, like double, double the number of men. And so we're, we actually encourage men to speak up. We've actually gone to like male schools to talk to them about, you know, being vulnerable and being open about their ordeals. We're making progress, but a lot more needs to be done on that. So this fact. Women Wednesday, men, we stand with you as well. And of course, organizations like Stand to End Rape are going to do everything to ensure that there are more provisions for you. But Aisha, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank it's been an so absolute much. pleasure to have this extremely necessary conversation. Thank you. Thank you. To enjoy more of this, our Ubunke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.